A Growing Culture is a nonprofit organization advancing a culture of farmer autonomy and agroecological innovation. We thank you for joining us today. It's now my pleasure to introduce the founder of A Growing Culture, Lauren Cardelli. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um, last week, I spoke about how uh, smallholder farmers on just 19% of cultivated land produce over 70% of the world's food consumed. When we let that statistic soak in, we can't help but wonder how does industrial farming systems get credit for feeding the world? How can they on only 80, on 81 percent of the cultivated land just produce less than 30 percent of the world's food consumed? We must ask who is more efficient, who is more adaptable, who should we be champion, and who do we trust to feed future generations? For the last 10 years, a growing culture has been dedicated to supporting local communities. We support farmers, peasants, and indigenous peoples to shape their own food systems. These communities are as diverse and adaptive as the farms we champion. However, far too often, society looks at farmers as simply beneficiaries. The work that we are trying to do, not just with this series, but with AGC in general, is to challenge that narrative. Farmers are not passive beneficiaries. They are active innovators who deserve parity, not share. Through this episode, we will learn from three different farmers on how they are resilient in the face of COVID, how their models don't just feed people, but nurture communities as well. First, I want to share a story because it is deeply relevant to this topic. Some years ago, while I was working in Western Kenya with some farmer innovators, this was before I had the privilege of meeting Joe Oko. Um, there was this model of agriculture that was being promoted from this organization. It was called push and pull. And it was so important because in Western Kenya, when they produce maize, there's the stem borer and the striga weed, which are the two biggest issues. The striga weed is this parasitic weed whose roots actually attach to the maize's roots. The stem borer pours into the cob and eats the maize out. This is devastating to farmers. However, this, this organization developed this method called push and pull. And what it was was a polyculture. So in between the maize, they planted desmodium, which was drought tolerant, which was a perennial, um, and it produced nitrogen and fertilized the, the field. Then at the end of the, of the, around the border of the maize field, they would plant three rows of napier grass. Napier grass is high, caloric energy, it's low in protein, but it's, it's, a, it's a staple feed for livestock. Um, whatever happened was the, the desmodium has this scent and that scent pushed away the stem borer and the napier attracted it. It was the pole. And, and the stem borer would lay its eggs on the napier grass and those eggs wouldn't be able to fully hatch because of the glue that the napier grass released. This was an amazing system. It, it, eradicated striga and it eradicated stem borer and is being spread all over. So I contacted this organization and, and their head facilitator for the Western district brought me out there and he's taken me to these farms and I'm seeing these, these unbelievable farmers that are like, look at the yield now. And it was amazing. You know, they were like, before we would have just one sack. Now we have 10, right? I mean, this, it was, it was undeniably an amazing innovation. However, alongside each of their maize plots, were tomato and cabbage and onion plots where they were growing monocultures and spraying chemicals. And I couldn't believe this. So after I'm seeing this and I asked him, I said, Wait, why are these other plots just monocultures? Why aren't they engaging in this polyculture? And he says, because we haven't designed the technique yet for them to grow tomatoes or cabbage or onions in a polyculture. And I said, well, you know, you work with thousands of farmers across Kenya are any of them doing research? And he looked at me and said, they don't know better. <laughs> this is the kind of trend in development. You teach a practice and have it scaled up, but there's no, there's no respect of the principles. There's no sharing of the principles. There's no respect of farmers being able to not just adopt, but to adapt and to innovate, right? Joe Oko, as you will hear about his innovation in the moment, he took that desmodium grass, and he innovated with it. He proved that man wrong, right? This episode's partner, 
an amazing organization named ProNova introduced me to Joe Oko. Joe Oko is actually on their board now. And this organization has been spending over 20 years working to promote these types of innovations around the world. So now I'd like to introduce Ruth Reeder, a journalist from Fast Company who covers the intersection between health and technology and who we are so fortunate to have moderate this session. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so the conversation we're having today is about how to operate an agricultural business uh, that is sustainable even in the space of a pandemic. Um, and the coronavirus outbreak has really, truly really tested uh, our food supply systems, right? I think one of the most visceral images that we've seen so far has been that of a California farmer tearing up his entire yield of lettuces because distributors, hotels, restaurants, uh, schools, would not buy that yield. And he didn't have the network to then sell that to like a grocery supply store or, or grocery store for sale. Um, another, Tyson Foods, enormous producer of products, um, you know, took out an ad in the New York Times to say that the food supply system, the food supply chain rather, is breaking. So we're seeing uh, a lot of strain on this industrial agriculture system that we've made in the US. Um, and you know, COVID has really exposed elements of our system that are just not sustainable. Uh, you know, we have prioritized efficiency, right? To get out cheap product, cheap meat product, uh, masses of people, and that you know was never a healthy system, right? Workers have, you know, it's never been good. For workers. A lot of these workers who work at these plants don't have health insurance. They work side by side. And, you know, the coronavirus, because of the nature of the way that it spreads, you know, has really exposed that. And so, you know, a number of these plants have been shut down. We're having to rethink the way that we, you know, the way that we create food, process food, uh, supply it to communities. Um, and as a result of that, we've seen a lot of interesting work being done by small farmers, medium farmers. Um, and there are three panelists here today have really interesting innovations. They have been able to, you know, continue their work despite challenges. Uh, and so that's, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So what we're going to do first is have each one of these panelists sort of give a little bit of a talk about what they do, maybe a little five minute chat. Uh, and because Lauren teed up so nicely uh, Joe's work, Joe, I would love for you to start uh, and tell everybody a little bit about the work that you do with those. Great. Second goal. Thank you, Ruth. I want to begin by saying that I'm grateful I got in, in touch with agency in Uganda. After that meeting, Lorraine sent an expert of innovation uh, documentation. We went through and then closed it with Lofoda Gmail. And Lofoda Gmail is the innovation I want to talk about now. When I say Lofoda Gmail, there is no word like that existing. This is an acronym where LO means locally, FO means formulated, DA means a daily good, and G means Growth meal. So when I say Lofoda, Lofoda G meal, I'm saying locally formulated daily good meal. That is the project I'm dealing with and very firmly. I'm not an individual in it. There are a number of people who have got into it and they love it. What I want to say is after being in connection with, with AGC, I learned personally, that there, is, there was more to be done for the community so that people can engage in daily good keeping for the milk and other uh, benefits they get from it. I decided to find, go out searching for seeds because locally community daily good meal was based on local fodder material which any good can take. So we learned that when goats take this, there is something more into them. And when we decided to get into this, we were making local regime 
because we had tested all the ingredients of Lofoda Gmail, what they will take at our research center and confirmed what actually the dairy goods need so that there is more milk. So I was rushing to ISIPE, this organization Lorraine was referring to because I had the actually use of and produce seeds. When I went there, I asked them to give me seeds which I could use to promote bulk production of Lofoda Jimmy. They thought I wanted this for striker weeds, stem borers, and so on. That when they told, took me to their, their farm to show, I said, no, I don't need it for that. I need it for goats. And there are so many other community members who are there specifically for the goats. They got excited. And then the heads of the departments came together and said, if that is the case, we are sending a team to go and make sure what you are doing is so. So they sent a team. That team confirmed over 30 people we were together and they said they were really interested in those seeds and they wanted to use it for the dairy goods. Then they, they, the, the agreement was that if it was going to benefit even more because they used to support individual farmers. But here now they are going to deal with very many farmers who use it for goats at the same time. Stem borer, striker weeds will go. So we were going to strike with three different bullets. One same thing. And that actually encouraged us quite a lot. Uh, briefly, that closes how it started off. But the way we prepare for the gym is we go for fresh, very good fodder materials. And in order to make sure we don't interfere with the environment, we don't go cut and carry. I think you understand when we talk of cut and carry for livestock. We just take the sheaves, the fresh ends, the soft leaves, it's not the full leaves, but the sheaves. Then we chop them with the, with the chop, uh, chop cutter. After chopping, we dry them in shade, just manually. Once they are dry, the whole thing is crushed, machine crushed, separately. After it is crushed separately, then we weigh in terms of what really the goods will need from those particular materials. And then we do the rationing, and the Lofoda Jimmy is ready. Then we now pack and sell to the farmers at very low cost because we wanted to encourage them. All of us in the team have used it. And one very important thing is when we use it, there is improvement of milk production. Where God was giving only half a liter, it will be more, either one liter or more. If it is two, it will be more. And this actually encouraged us so much. And with our objective of promoting dairy goat uh, keeping, we found Lofoda was key. And so many people have come into it. A number of them now, even those who are living in towns, if they decide to buy a goat, a dairy goat, they simply go and build a unit, then buy Lofoda G meal, the goat will not be feeding from outside. The man will not go to cut, to interfere with the environment. They'll just feed the goats from there. Actually, we have maintained samples which we can show. And the, I wish it were possible we were in a, in a farm, you would have seen those things. Now, closing on that, how we form it, I want to say that there is a benefit and there are beneficiaries. The greatest number of people benefiting from very good keeping as a lot of, as a, as a result of law for the Jimmy are mainly youth, women, and you'll find some few middle-aged men also getting into it. But the key people are women because the young youth may actually go to help them, but they are using it. The benefits they draw out of this is that each dairy goat can kill twice in a week, in, in, a, in, a, in a year. And killing twice in a year, most of them actually bring twins and twins and twins. So a lady keeping dairy goods and having the kids will have a lot of money in the pocket for educating the children and even for household problems. What I know, and even now, a number of them keep on ringing and asking me if there are people needing the kids, because the kids are there already. One kid 
just about six months is not more less than 13,000 shillings, Kenya shillings. And the milk is not less than 100 shillings. This has really given them a great deal of support. And considering that these are very local women and local people, it's a great benefit and actually a blessing from God. It is like a God given. Now, the next thing I would like to say is in terms of the benefits, there is economical benefit, there is social benefit, there is also environmental benefit. Socially, they are taking milk, which is nutritious and actually medicinal. Mm -hmm. So the children fed on this will not have problems with the, with, with the skin problems and so on and so forth. So that is a great social benefit. Medicinal milk and nutrition. The final thing is on economic, uh, but in fact, I have mentioned, they sell the, 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 the kids and get money for feeding the family and for educating the children. Finally, Environmentally, the process we use in preparing Lofoda tea is very friendly and sustainable because we don't we chop off the trees. We, we just take the leaves and the trees remain sprouting and therefore help in carbon emission, reducing carbon emission. And actually, that has helped quite a lot. And the way now we feed the goats. A lady needs to get Lofoda Jimmy, put it in a trough, and the water is there. Then actually she can go and do some other work. When she comes, she can only change. Uh, at the end of it, I feel anything else can come, and I may add in terms of questions, but that is basically what we have. If my colleagues may have not got it well, if they ask questions, I will answer. Thank you, Ruth. Great. Uh, and now we're going to go to Yemi, who is going to tell us about urban, urban hydroponic farming uh, in Brooklyn. Forgot to unmute myself there. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Yemi Amu. I live in Brooklyn, New York. I run an urban aquaponics farm, actually, not hydroponics, um, in Brooklyn. The farm is called Oko Farms, or the company is called Oko Farms, and we install the first publicly accessible, all, probably also one of the few publicly accessible aquaponics farms in the city. We're also the largest. We provide a space where people can come and engage with this technology um, and this method of food production. And for those who don't know what aquaponics is, it is a system of food production whereby you grow plants in a soil-less environment. And along with those plants, you're also cultivating fish. What the fish do is provide waste, um, nutrient, really their waste is nutrients for the plants to grow, and the plants serve as a filtration system for the fish. We chose this particular form of agriculture because it focuses on water use. It focuses on water conservation which is big. I was born and raised in Lagos, Nigeria, and I understand how scarce of a resource water is. And um, understanding how we use water and the ways in which water can be used in more conservative forms in food production is very important. People use aquaponics for different reasons. Some people are interested in having a sustainable source of protein along with vegetables for um, vegetables to both eat and sell. Aquaponics is practiced, you know, in places around the world, but especially in places where um, drought is an issue or access to fresh water is an issue. Um, when we started the farm in 2013, it was on an abandoned lot in New York City. Um, with the help of the community, we were able to set the farm up. And the intention really um, was not to grow, necessarily to grow food to sell to the community, but it was really to create a space for those of us who live in an urban environment to be educated and engaged around environmental stewardship and food production. Um, I strongly believe that you cannot have a safe and secure food system if you have an ignorant and uneducated consumer base. It's not possible. Um, not everyone is going to farm, but 
you know, we're going to have scientists. We need scientists who are working with farmers, who are working in collaboration with farmers. Um, we need young people who have farmers in the environment so that they can aspire to become food policy advocates, so that they can aspire to become climate advocates or climate um, um, activists. You know, there's so, we, we need people who live in urban environments to care about birds, to care about ecological biodiversity. So if you do not have farms and urban spaces, you cannot approach this. I think we often look at farming just about nourishing bodies, but we need to nourish our minds. We need to nourish the environment. We, need, we desperately need ecological biodiversity. Um, we desperately need to conserve our resources that are dwindling every day. And farming in urban environments is one of the few ways that you can make, you can um, bring this education and bring this awareness to people. Um, when I first learned about aquaponics um, in 2011, I went on this pilgrimage to Florida. I spent time on an aquaponics farm in, Flor in, the, in the woods in Florida. And one of the things that um, our aquaculture teacher used to say to us every day is, what happens, for those of you who live in a city, what happens when food cannot get to you? What happens when the supply chain is broken? And at that time, we were thinking about climate change. We weren't thinking about a virus. We weren't thinking about a pandemic. Um, and this pandemic is showing us how important it is for us to be able to, to know how to grow our own food. A lot of what we do is not just show people how to grow food, but teach them how to do it for themselves. Um, what happens if the supply system is broken? What happens to those of us who live in, in cities when food cannot get to us? What happens when we're watching farms in rural spaces destroy their crops, but we are starving and fighting for food in urban areas? Um, everything that we do at Oko Farms, our focus is not just about growing food to people. It is about, about empowering communities. We go into spaces, we develop aquaponic systems, we teach people how to farm aquaponically. Um, we're doing it online right now. I am just so, I am afraid and hopeful <laughs> for um, urban residents because we do not have the tools to empower ourselves and we need more people who have the tools. And our focus is just making sure that we are in a space where we can empower people to do that. That was great. And yeah, I mean, I think your work also speaks to the fact that, you know, the idea of like local food um, versus sort of a lot of the like, industrial foods that we see that are put in communities like Brooklyn um, that are not only not sustainable in, in a pandemic, but then also are not really healthy foods in the first place which is a whole other topic we'll get into. <laughs> so finally, uh, I'd like to introduce Asher who uh, works at Hickory Knot Gap and is going to tell us a little bit about the small and medium uh, meat producers. Thanks, Ruth, and thanks everybody for tuning in. It's a real honor to be here with these other great panelists and um, just thrilled that this Hunger for Justice series is happening and um, I'm grateful for this time as we think about all, all these, these complexities in our food system and in, in light of a pandemic and, and what the world is at the moment. And so just a little background on myself. I, I'm, I'm the director of ag operations here at Hickory Nut Gap. And we have two companies. We have Hickory Nut Gap Farm, which is a farm in Fairview, south of Asheville. We're in the Appalachian Mountains in Western North Carolina. And the, the family farm has been here for over 100 years as an operating farm. And what we've been doing now is about 20 years old, and we're very much in the niche meat space, if you will. Um, we're, not, we're not enormous. We sell at the local tailgate markets here in the community. We have some wholesale partners. We uh, also sell um, some of our products through our other business. And I'm here to kind of wear both hats today and discuss a little bit about it on the more hyper-local level uh, from a meat production perspective, as well as from the more regional level. And so the other company that I work with on the supply chain side is Hickory Nut Gap Meats. So we have farm and meats, and meats is, is an aggregator, is a food hub, um, 
we're a marketing brand, if you will, and we have a collective of producers. You know, we're working directly and indirectly with over a hundred different farmers in North Carolina, Southern Virginia, Eastern Tennessee, Georgia, South Carolina, and these are beef and pork producers. And um, by aggregating the product and shipping full tractor trailer loads, call them a pot load of say 150 head hogs or uh, 45 head of cattle, we're able to get access to markets and, and start to actualize processing efficiencies that allow our price point to enter grocery store and retail settings. Um, and, and in some ways the scale, though it's not nearly what we see at these very large vertically integrated meat companies, um, it's large enough where we're able to kind of get, start to get our price point down so that um, folks that are not in the, folks that, I'm just going to say norm, normal families and folks, if you will, can afford the product because a lot of the challenges with grass fed and finished beef and pasture raised pork and small scale agriculture is small scale ends up being very expensive and it becomes hard to access unless you are wealthy or you are able to spend a very large portion of your income. And so that's a really privileged place to be. So I think what we're really, what we really try to do at, at the meats company is, is continue to scale, support farmers with fair trade price. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but um, really supporting the farmers and, and, and sharing their story and helping them continue to have access to a stable market that is not commodity based where, you know, it's flowing up and down and there's a lot of risk. And so kind of work on both sides of the, the company. So I'm here today to represent your kind of small niche meat producer and who's direct marketing as well as the more regional food supply chain um, with regards to, to specifically meats and you know, we're in the natural meat space, for lack of a better term, antibiotic hormone free, grass fed and finished, pasture raised, our hogs are on, we're non GMO, we have a high animal welfare standard. So we're kind of, we're in that space. So those are the hats I'm wearing, wearing today. And um, I'm just excited to be here and, and look forward to the dialogue. So thank you. Great. Okay, so I want to, I want to start off small and then go big um, about sort of the the ways in which all of these uh, these three panelists have been able to sort of withstand. Um, so, Joe, I want to start with you, and I want to talk a little bit about how you came up with the innovation that you did. And so, I'm going to give a little bit of background. Joe, uh, Joe works with goats, as we've talked about in dairy goats. Um, and one of the things that would happen before he came up with this goat fodder uh, is that you know drought drought would come. And, and goats would not, a lot of goats would not survive it. And so this obviously has an incredible impact to the business. Um, and so, so the real innovation we came up with was a way to basically have sustainable uh, goat food year round. Um, so Joe, how did you, how did you figure out uh, how, to, how to create this food or how did you figure out that you could dry the food and then turn it into this sustainable pellet product? I wish to stay at the beginning that dairy goods were not common things in this community. But somewhere around 1988 to 1990, uh, a, a, a missionary, the Catholic missionary from Ireland, sympathized with one particular section of the Christians in our community and brought some dairy goods. When the dairy goods started producing a lot of milk, everybody got very much interested and the agreement was those who were given the dairy goods would pass on. If they got a kid, a dog kid, they pass on to the others. Then a number of them were there, they were now keeping the dairy goods. The issue was the fodder. Because in our place, it is very common that during drought, the greens go. One particular section of that story was very sad for us. A young lady was very keen in keeping her goat and getting a lot of milk, feeding the children very well. Went to search for the fodder, it was not there, and the lady went to pluck those which were next to a gorge. It is very sad that they slipped 
went into the gorge and is no more. We were very sad. So it meant, therefore, we needed to find a way of having the fodder, the feeds, ready so that ladies or any others who are keeping the dairy goods could not go for that kind of scaring thing. I would like to mention that our livestock office in Kisumu, at that time it was around Kisumu County, asked for those who are interested, the goat keepers who are interested to make a dairy goat group. So somewhere around 2006, a dairy goat group was formed. I was the chairman. Then I started seeing these problems. There were no feeds and nobody could, could help when the goat was now lacking feed and was dying. A very painful thing. I had my goats. I had somebody who was helping me to keep the goats. So the local fodder around my home, he went chopping them, chopping them, chopping them. One of them is gray by color. The tree was chopped for the goats, could not sprout within any short time until maybe some number of years. I started now crying and wondering what I would do. What I saw is when the tree branches were hung and the goats were eating, some leaves were dropping down under the shade and drying. And whenever I removed them to take the vitamins in the sun, they were rushing for the dried leaves. Then I thought drying the fodder when, I was, when they were fresh was going to be a better way. That is how it started. And I want to tell you, uh, uh, we did some work. I chopped the, the soda fodder, and I saw that if I went taking the branches, I would not have it any other time. And that is how we went in, into the leaves and the sheaves. So that is what we chopped using fungus manual. Later on, somebody found us and was sympathizing. He gave us, uh, and I would like to say that was World Vision, which is based in America. World Vision was in our area. World Vision saw this thing, gave us chaff cutters, and now we went on chopping those things very easily. Lofoda Jimmy came out from around 2009 when pro the promotion of local innovations came in. Then the idea of seeing goats taking leaves which were dry came in. I wrote out some kind of uh, concept to the, our research center, and they saw it was a wonderful thing. And then the whole thing sprang up. I would like to tell you that we are very happy about the whole thing. Yeah. If there is any other question, you may ask, but that's how it came up. The, so, yeah, so I think that that's so interesting. And then you, um, so you already had, so now you're making this uh, goat fodder, but you're doing it also through a network of farmers, which you're, and then you're also selling it. Uh, so this is really a group effort. And so I want, I know that um, before you started making this fodder, you had a network of farmers that was regional. Um, but I am sort of curious how you sort of mobilized people to get in on this effort. Like, how did you get people to, work with you to help grow the Desmodium? The Desmodium is, the, is not the key component. The key component at the local fodder. We were now seeing during drought, even what we harvested and kept was not going to be enough. So we were rushing to find out uh, exotic seeds so that we could plant and burn so that we have more. That is how we went to Isipe. And then we found that they were, they were having Lofoda, not, not only Desmodium, they were having Desmodium and they were having Brachelia. That is, that is the other, the, 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 term, the one which, uh, which uh, Lorraine was talking about. They gave us both, and both of them have now helped quite a lot in bulking so that the feed will not be short at any time. Whether it is drought or whether it is rain, like now there have been a lot of rains, if you went behind my, my, my house here, there's a small plot, which is just 20 by 20 meters. I'm telling you, we harvest both Desmodium and Brachelia, which goes into uh, about a ton, just 20 by 20 meters. 
So that has helped us quite a lot. But how did you get other farmers to sort of get in on this effort to like to, you know, work to both make sure that they are growing and harvesting this local fodder, the local leaves? Okay. Now, because we started off as a group of Lagos keepers, they saw the importance of actually preparing the meal and keeping it for the adverse climate change. And so many others who are interested and saw how we were benefiting from the milk and the sale of the goat kids, they now were buying the goats, the goat kids from those who are having. And that is how it spread. Then we went into talking to them and telling them how important keeping a dairy goat was for the small scale farmer. And actually, I would like to say that outside our dairy goat team, those who are ordinary farmers, particularly the, 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 the ladies, have really worked on that, got the dairy goats, and are having very good farms. And when this issue of desmodium came in, I talked to the ECP people, so they asked me to call others. So we called so many farmers. And they, those who came in with the idea of making sure it was dairy goats and, uh, and the striker weed and so on, they planted small plots, and in their plots, the goats now lack nothing to do with fodder. They have it. That's great. So we uh, have to educate them. We have to go talk to them. Yes. Um, so I, I just want to highlight. So here in 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 Joe's case, in Joe's farm, and Joe's network of farmers, we're talking about using you know multiple farmers to to create like these these food systems that are both sustain that are sustainable essentially growing fodder to feed the goats and then also selling that excess fodder to other goat farmers um to help yes. the greater community as well right and so i, I want to shift actually to asher to talk more about sort of networks of farmers and sort of how you can uh utilize uh groups of small and medium farmers to sort of make a big impact community. Um, so Asher, in your case, and you talked a little bit about this, about um, how you, how Hickory Nut Gap is also sort of like a collective in addition to like the farm itself. So can you tell me, how did you, how did you bring together this network of farmers? You know, like how did they, just how did it amass? It's a good question. Um, we, so our founder and our CEO, Jamie Ager, who is, um, a local fellow who lives out here in Fairview and, and really is the, the family, the family farm that we're farming at Hickory Nut Gap Farm. It's his family. And so Jamie is a very friendly, outgoing person who really enjoys building relationships. And so over 20 years ago, about 20 years ago at this time, Jamie just started networking. And, you know, it was really clear that there was demand for the products that we offer for grass fed beef and pasture raised pork. Um, livestock coming from more agroecological systems that are working with nature and minimizing inputs and minimizing synthetics and things like that. And so Jamie just went out and started networking. And then it became very real that the demand was there. And, you know, over time, one thing led to another. And it, you know, we were able to start with a core group of, of farmers that really knew what they were doing, that were able to deliver that had the land that, that were able to scale. And we, we started there. And then from there, it just becomes kind of networking and word of mouth. You know, the neighbors start to see the way that these farms, the, the way that their neighbor farms land looks. They start to hear that they're getting a premium price on the calves that they're buying over the market. They're starting to see that, that they are kind of separating slightly from the extreme fluctuations of commodity markets and, and the prices that are, you know, like what Lauren said, you know, are, aren't really matching the true cost of production. There's no parity there. And that's very much what the United States agriculture system has, has been designed to do is to, you know, race to the bottom, cheap food, and, and in some ways not, you know, most of, most of the crops we grow and the prices that the farmer gets are nowhere close to what the true costs of production are. And so there's some hope in that and farmers are able to start to network and communicate and word of mouth gets out. And before you know it, 
we're, you know, we're at over a hundred producers that we work with directly and indirectly. And by indirectly, I mean that we have some, some key farmers that, that raise beef and maybe we have some folks that are, that are finishing, um, you know, maybe 1500 to 2000 head per year. They have their own micro network of neighbors and people that are close to them that are feeding into their supply. So just kind of has grown through word of mouth. And, you know, I mean, a big driver is economics, right? I mean, most of what these farmers want to do is make sure that their family farmland stays in their family and, and stays productive and doesn't get developed. And that the rural livelihoods that many of them have seen slip over the past 50 to 70 years in their communities, that those can be rebuilt. And so when we're able to offer a premium price, um, that provides hope. And, and, and beyond just a premium price, it's a more what I like to say is a sustainable pay price. And that's very much a part of our dialogue with the farmers is it's not like we're here to just pay you this and that's that. We have annual producer meetings. We're working with these farmers to discuss where does a, what's your break even price? How does this work? Is this even working for you? If not, maybe we need to reevaluate our side of things. So that's how it grew is mostly word of mouth and networking. But then I think being able to, as a, as a company, enter into a healthy dialogue and build that trust. And that's what's really enabled us, I think, to, to grow and be successful. So I want to talk about that price real quick, and then I want to dive into sort of like what makes this uh, a sustainable business in a pandemic. But first, um, tell me about how you command that price uh, that you do. And also, can you talk a bit about um, how Hickory Nut Gap has been able to diversify where it's selling its meat. So not just to, you know, restaurants, for example, uh, and sort of some of these outlets that are a bit smaller in scale, ultimately, and, and ways in which small farmers have actually been pinched uh, during the pandemic. You guys haven't. So please, yeah, talk to me a little bit about that. I think with regards to the price, because our product is, is more expensive than conventional meat on the shelf in a grocery store. And consumers typically think in images. And there's this, as, as consumers are becoming more educated, as Yimmy said, and I think that there's t more growth and, and there's more education that can happen. But consumers are far more educated now than they were even 20 years ago. I can speak from many of my own personal family that is um, kind of tuned into this. And so with that in mind, grocery stores and, and restaurants are all interested in this. And, and there's demand out there for local and regional food, it's food that comes with a story, food that is connected to a place and consumers identify and like to connect with that. And grocery stores and retailers and restaurants have are learning that and they realize that I can sell a hamburger for $9.99 when it used to be $7.99 because, well, most consumers still want the hamburger, right? And then when you attach the story and, and, and you start to relate where, where that money is going, that it's going right back into the counties surrounding you or into the state that you're from, people are paying for it. And I think that's part of what has happened here um, with our demand and our ability to, to grow an inner market space because, and, and I'll go to the grocery store and our breakfast sausage is sold out right here in Western North Carolina and, and everything else is in stock because I think people are really connecting and identifying that with, with our brand and how, and supporting farmers. Talk about how you got into grocery stores, because I think that is a big question for a lot of small and medium farmers is that right. it is hard to get into grocery stores, but you guys have been able to. And the biggest issue with grocery stores is the price point at like a large retailer like Whole Foods or Ingalls or Kroger or Publix or Harris Teeter or Lowe's Foods or wherever you are in the United States, at least. I don't know national grocery chains, but those large, those large grocery stores are set up in a very rigid structure. And that's frustrating, right? Like, I don't want to have to deal with that. But we had to in order to get in that space. And so for us, it was just scale. And that's where aggregating multiple farmers together. For example, we loaded out pigs last week. There were five producers that filled that truck of pigs. It wasn't just one or one company. They all showed up, the hogs were sorted, and that, that gets us into a processing plant that has the technology 
to label meat and 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 put all of the tracking device, all of the the packaging that's needed to go in a grocery store. It has the, those those bigger plants have shelf life that small local mom and pop abattoirs will never be able to have because they just cannot afford the state of the art equipment that gets you 60 days of shelf life for a product that's fresh. So it's really a matter of scale. And that's really how we were able to get into the grocery stores. And then honestly, just having to jump through all the, the annoying hoops of getting, getting barcodes and getting SKU numbers and working through that process, working with the packaging companies to get them on there. And so that's in some ways, I view that as a service that we are providing. And then all the farmer has to do is drop their animals off. They don't have to deal with marketing. They're not hustling. A lot of the farmers we work with do not want to direct market. They do not want to sell. They just want to farm. And that's what they're that's what they're in it for. And that's a lot of the producers that we deal with. There's also a lot of folks that are like me that I love to sell at a tailgate market all day. But that's not for everybody, right? And so that's really the way that we did it is we provided the service of doing all the packaging and jumping through those hoops, working out the logistics with the producers, paying for the trucking, paying for all the processing at the processing plant. And then at the end of the day, paying those farmers back a, pay, a fair price, factoring that price into our product. And then that's the price that the grocery store has. And then it's a matter of, of our sales team helping to educate the meat buyers in these departments about, look, you're, you know, consumers want this. And like, here's why. And let's talk about that story. And we'll come in and maybe cook some, some hamburger at the case and talk about it with a 250 customers that come through the grocery store today and kind of share that story. So that's how we were able to get into some of the larger grocery retailers in our area, which has been a key success for us during this time, because we know restaurants all shut down and, and my heart goes out to everybody in the restaurant industry. Uh, just, it, it, I mourn each day. Um, but for us, we're thankful from the farmer's perspective, we've been able to pivot into grocery retail because we already had a foot in that space. And um, that's just adaptation, which is kind of a key flexibility on into adaptation as a key part of resiliency. And so that's, that's part of part of how we were able to get into the grocery world. That's great. Um, I'm going to move now to Yemi because I think we you know a lot of what we're talking about right now is storytelling and, and education uh, and communicating with people about food, which is so much a part of your aquaponics farm. You know, it's not just that you're growing, right? You're also teaching. Um, so I'm curious, you know, in your engagement with the community right now, what are some of the things you're hearing and seeing? What are people asking about? What are people talking about when they come to your farm? Um, the biggest thing right now is people want to know where to find seeds. <laughs> people are really interested in growing their own food. That's what I've seen consistently. Where do I find seeds? How, when I get the seeds, what do I do with them? How do I put the seeds in the ground? My neighbor told me to put the seeds, you know, uh, six inches into the ground. Is that correct? <laughs> you know, people are really interested in learning just how to grow something for themselves. I'm in an apartment. I don't have any backyard space. Can I still grow something? Um, what can I do? We also like support people with soil growing, not just aquaponics, you know? I want to have an aquaponics system in my classroom, or I want to put one, I want to teach my students how to, to, you know, set up an aquaponics systems in their home. So those are really the things that we are um, responding to right now. It's just making people, uh, allowing people to, to empower themselves. I think even the knowledge makes people feel safe, you know? I know that I can get seeds from somewhere. I know I can get plants from somewhere. I know what to do when I get the seeds and I know how to put the seeds in the ground and I know where to put the seeds and what type of environment um, to nurture the seeds in. Even little things like um, how, do we grow, how do we grow more food from food? That's another big thing, you know? How do I grow more onions from an onion ball? How do I, you know, folks are just really interested in ways um, that they can grow food that is also applicable and adaptable to the environment. That's been, um, I think, the most urgent request at the moment. And is that, do you find that that's because of, or like has been time to sort of like the outbreak that people have been more food concerned uh, since the coronavirus hit? Um, I think people have been concerned before, 
but the coronavirus um, has made it more urgent, especially in communities of color. Um, we often are left to tend to ourselves. You know, we are, most community gardens you find in New York are in um, communities of color. They're in spaces that are considered food deserts. I know that's not the word now. I don't know what the correct word is, but there are spaces around the city where there is very little access to fresh food. Um, and most people in low income communities of color are um, dependent on community gardens and the local farmers markets in their uh, neighborhoods to get access to food, right? And then the next step now is maybe I can't get to the community garden, you know? People who are working in community gardens also have to keep themselves safe and can't expose themselves to too many people. So the next step is, how do I grow this food for myself? If I have a, a small yard, if I have a sunny window, how can I grow my own food? Um, how do I save money? Because the price of food has also gone up. Um, how do I save money by just being able to grow lettuce at home or just being able to grow spinach? How do I keep myself healthy by growing herbs that can keep me healthy, you know? These are the questions that are more urgent for people now um, than they were before the pandemic, but it's always been there. Can you also talk about the accessibility of what you're doing? Like how accessible is aquaponics? Um, is, you know, soil growing more accessible? What, what do you tell people? What is your experience? Mm -hmm. um, aquaponics is, accessible and not accessible at the same time. I think it is the knowledge that is inaccessible. In terms of the practice itself, it is so adaptable. Anybody can do it anywhere. You can do it on a small scale, you can do it on a large scale. You can do it in your apartment, you can do it in a classroom. Um, we have lots of systems that we've put in classrooms and students are able to grow um, salad greens and herbs and have you know salads and actually eat the salad in the classroom and share in that communal experience. Um, the bigger challenge is just understanding the knowledge um, and having access to the knowledge. And unfortunately, um, for whatever reason, um, it is not, that knowledge is not as accessible as it should be. Most people who practice aquaponics and even hydroponics, I would put those two in the same category, um, are very secretive with it, you know? Um, it has this like shroud around it where it's practiced in indoor spaces with fancy technology and it can be intimidating to a lot of people. Um, it is why my, I see my primary role as educating people and making the knowledge accessible. I am a black woman in New York City who is, you know, farming on a very, you know, or dense urban environment next to a liquor store and a smoke shop. If I can do it, <laughs> you know, if I can do it, anybody can do it, you know, and I'm, and, and which is why I'm all, I'm so, I'm hoping that the knowledge becomes increasingly accessible to people, especially in areas where people need it the most. Yes, and I think local, uh, food accessibility is like obviously so top of mind right now. It, it's interesting. You're seeing not just in urban, I mean, like everywhere, I feel like, you know, tillers are sold out and, you know, <laughs> everybody is gardening right now. It's like a reprise of uh, victory gardens, right? Um, Asher, I want to go back to you for a second um, because I want you to talk a little bit, or if you can tell me, um, you know, why, so at, when I started in the beginning, I was talking about how all these uh, meat processing plants have had to shut down um, at various times. There's obviously been a strain on them. Um, why, why has there not been a strain on what you're doing? What are you doing differently? Why are you guys allowed to operate in these sort of big industrial facilities or not? That's a great question. And, you know, there is there is a strain on us a little bit in the sense that there's a big bottleneck right now on processing. This, you know, that article in the New York Times, the inaccessibility of meat on the grocery store shelves has made a lot of consumers nervous. Um, commodity meat, commodity meats in the U.S., the prices are all rising and are expensive. And so it's, at this time, a lot of these local meat supply chains are competing on price. And so 
that said, there's the consumers are kind of switching into this mode of being really interested in it. And because of that, there's a bottleneck in, in processing plants right now. And most of that's around skilled labor because it's not, you know, we do not value meat cutters in the US, like a lot of farm workers and low, it's considered a lower end job. And because of that, it doesn't pay well. It's on, it can be unsafe. Um, and so, but, but it's also highly skilled. You need to be safe. And so because of that, there's this bottleneck. But, how, but with that said, to answer your question, there, the, the biggest thing is scale. So a lot of the, you know, the hyper local, if you will, folks like us at, you know, Hickory Nut Gap Farm, I send four pigs a week. They're going to a North Carolina Department of Agriculture inspected plant. It is a Vietnamese man and his wife that run it. It is very small. They can only do say 30 pigs a day. And all they're inspected to do is to, um, they cannot cut and wrap. So we get the whole pig back. It goes to our butcher shop. Again, very small. I got two staff members. Everybody's wearing a mask and, and being tuned in from a safety standpoint. They get it cut and wrapped in our own shop here. And we take it to the tailgate market and sell it. So a lot of it has to do with the scale. You know, the, the, the big difference between our plants and in, and then shifting over to hickory nut gap meats where the plants would be considered a little bit larger than what I just described. They're still not, they're still not quite the same size as, as a large industrial plant that has been very much systematized like a manufacturing facility where you have a huge line of staffers all shoulder to shoulder, each doing one cut on the animal or maybe two as it moves down the processing line. And so that environment, as we know, we're talking thousands of people shoulder to shoulder in a cold room with maybe two bathrooms to share. And that whole place is just an environment that can quickly spread. Our plants are smaller and have the flexibility to staff a little less. We have seen some slowdowns. They're staffing less. They took COVID seriously. They all bought people masks right away because that they're all family owned. And so they really care about their own business. So like, you know, I, if, if my employees get sick, my family's own well-being, this plant's going to close. So they took it really seriously at the beginning, which was also helpful. And, you know, a lot of the medium plants that, are, that, that local folks in our communities are using to sell meat at your tailgate market or direct to restaurants, you know, you might have two people that process that pig into everything as opposed to, say, 50 people that are processing that pig, each doing one cut. And so that's another reason there's just a lot more space in the in the cut room and it's easier to distance and so the plants have not been shut down with massive outbreaks so i think it's a combination of scale i think it's a combination of the fact that they're family owned and they were taken really seriously you know how serious does smithfield really think about their plant in the dakotas it's not really owned by a family um and they just shut it down and everybody's well-being there i mean they just shut it down see you guys you know we're cool with that that's not the same for the plants we use. It would be a huge deal for not only them and their families, but the community around it. It's not to say that Smithfield shutting down was not a huge deal for all those employees. I don't want to give that impression, but I think there's a was a real seriousness taken that that, that we're fortunate for, and we're still nervous <laughs> that it could happen. Um, but I think that's kind of the main thing is 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 scale and flexibility, and that they took it serious. That's great. So I have one final question for all of you and I want, and so we're going a little bit over, so I apologize to anybody who has to drop off, but um, bear with me. Um, and, I'll, and so I'm gonna ask you variations of the same question, which is essentially, what opportunity is there now to sort of like shift uh, the way that we operate? Because it seems like there is a bit of an opportunity here. And Joe, I wanna start with you because, you know, you've already had to shift, right? Because of drought. Um, and you figured out how to shift your food system. And so tell me, like, what, what, you know, when, when problems arise, when challenges arise, whether they're pandemics or sort of environmental factors, like, you know, what is the opportunity that you see to sort of shift the way things are done? I did not talk about the, the, the epidemic because I knew that it would come up in a question. To, to us, it is like uh, an opportunity for everybody to know that keeping a dairy good at home and you have your milk and you, you can sell and get a lot of money will be the safest way to make sure you are enclosed 
whether or not it was a government directive or not, we have something to make use of internally because on top of having the dairy goat and the milk, these people have their kitchen gardens and they have their, uh, their, their, their other crops which they have actually harvested. So inside, they have nothing they are going out to get. This epidemic has encouraged us to understand that doing the local things which support us with, from within is a great effort for one to take. And so uh, I would like to say that the COVID uh, epidemic is there, but the majority of the community I describe as having keeping the dairy goods, they do not have. Did we lose Joe? Well, go to towns or not, they have what they need at home. They are self reliant. And because of one thing that comes out like the COVID, even now, this team going. Hello? Yeah. I think yes. it's just, just no, I think you're something is say. I think you're okay. We can hear you now. Hello? You can hear me now? Yeah. Okay. What Hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, all right. What, what I said about the epidemic, what I said about the epidemic is it has encouraged the community to go there good keeping using Lofoda G meal because they'll get what they need, food and nutrition security from within. They don't have to go to any town. They don't have to worry about whatever they will, they, they will miss because the food will be there. They have their kitchen gardens from where they harvest their vegetables. They use it with the, the crops they have already to make their meals and we are going on well. They are not worried about where to go and get food. And I'm saying the COVID epidemic has done a lot to help people know more that keeping a daily good, which is locally available and using Lofoda G meal, which is drawn from local materials, is very much encouraging. They don't go anywhere. Actually, one thing I did not say is Lofoda G meal has no chemical additive at all, and it has helped people so much. That's what I wanted to add. That's great. That's great. Yummy, I, I think that I have a similar question for you that I think is around um, what is like the opportunity locally? You know, I think there's so many interesting things going on, whether it is about people thinking about their food sources. Uh, thinking about vegetables maybe a bit more generally and growing their own food. So I'm curious, from your perspective, what do you think that the opportunity that COVID-19 has sort of brought up? Um, I think that beyond just people learning to grow food themselves or having the, the, the knowledge and skills to grow food themselves, the reality is that we live in an urban environment and not everyone has that space. Um, there is, however, a huge opportunity for the city to come up with policy that supports or urban farming. Um, there is an opportunity right now for the city to stop putting these high rise development um, and valuing the high rise development over valuing lives. Um, there are about 596 acres of empty lots in New York City. Lots that are sitting empty that people could be growing food on. Um, that we could be feeding people. I think these are opportunities that the city needs to take advantage of. For people who have space, places of worship, hospitals, especially schools, this is also an opportunity to bring food into these spaces and grow food into the, in these spaces. We know now that most of the children in New York get their meals at school. You know, 
why not also have farms and gardens in schools already so that parents can also get the vegetables when they go pick up their kids you know it just makes sense why not take advantage of advantages of the space we have right now to grow for people i'm just thinking that this is beyond what individuals can do at this point um it is up to the city to also step up um and stop valuing you know these high-rise developments and stop valuing capital over human lives um the reason that we're seeing the devastation of covid 19 in new york city is because of um type 2 diabetes and heart disease and all these diseases that are directly linked to food and health you know and without getting access without getting people access to fresh foods and vegetables we cannot get the city back to where it needs to be i think the onus has been too much on people why is that why are there more fast food restaurants than they are, you know, spaces that are making fresh food avail available to people. It does not make sense. It doesn't make sense. And this is an, an opportunity now for the city to start thinking about resilience and how to make sure that the residents, same people who are essential workers, you know, communities of color that are being devastated are also the communities that are doing the work of essential workers in New York City. So if we want to have essential workers during the next pandemic, maybe we should start investing in communities where they live and work. So this is oftentimes um, the narrative tends to be about what individuals can do. I think we should be thinking about what we can do collectively. Right now we need to be pushing the city. We need to be pushing for policy that um, makes food, good food, fresh food, healthy, nourishing food available to people having more green spaces available. People who are, who are living with asthma are also being affected. If the air where you live is not clean, it makes you vulnerable. One of the best places to have clean, one of the best ways to have clean air is also to have plants growing and these plants can serve as food and, and medicine. So I'm hoping that those in power see this as an opportunity and I'm hoping that the rest of us collectively um use this opportunity to push for better for ourselves that is great that's a good answer asher uh i'm turning back to you i mean we've talked quite a bit about you know some of the opportunity that you've already exploited but i want to see if there's anything else other opportunities that we didn't get a chance to talk about here within uh the outbreak for farmers you know, in the in 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 my sector, you know, I talked to a number of local farmers, and you know, some people have doubled their sales. I had another farm that's gone up 150 percent. Um, one farm went up four times in their in their meat sales, but lost restaurants. But at the end of the day, it was still a threefold increase of their revenue. And the interesting thing is, is the meats back on the shelves in the grocery stores. A lot of times now, it is a little more expensive than pre-pandemic. But what we're seeing is that the our demand has not dropped and we're kind of what we were waiting for it because we are all selling more products than we were before the pandemic. But what we're starting to see is that this, I feel like this pandemic has, has kind of educated consu some consumers around the frailty of our centralized food, food systems. And they're starting to fee see and understand how more regional and local supply chains are more resilient and secure. And so I think, the opportunity for farmers here is to scale if you're local and you're not in the local, if you're small, you know, I, I all, you know, I'm all for homesteading. I'm all for somebody that has five pigs. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you've got some acreage, it's, it's time to scale. The demand is there. And, and one of the biggest problems with local food is it is just too small to, to create a price point that is actually accessible and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that we're pretty small our price points at the top but there are people there is people our farmers out there that have acreage or maybe access to family land and so to me that's part of the opportunity is to start planning for scale and being ready to deliver on a good healthy nutritious product to to consumers and so that to me is is the people that are going to the farmers that are going to be able to take advantage of this are the ones that are thinking ahead that are planning for that and 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 that are going to kind of utilize this moment in history 
to, to, to grow and, and, and be able to deliver. And I think if you deliver to a customer, whether it's a chef or a farmer and it's week after week or a grocery store, and you can actually deliver the products what they ordered and it's on time, then that's a customer that's going to come back. Not every time, but a lot of times when you can deliver on something, people will come back, especially when they start to learn the story, taste the difference, understand that the meat's GMO free. These, all these other little selling points have that connection. It's in, so to me, that's just the real opportunity for all local and regional farmers, whether it's vegetables, whether it's meat, whether it's fruits, um, you know, fiber, there, there's a real chance, there's a real opportunity here. And so um, I encourage everybody out there to, to try to seize the moment. There's also a great, you know, there's a, you know, getting access to capital is obviously a thing, but there's, there, there are loans, there are grants, there's a lot of interest in supporting these regional and local food systems. And, and so now's a great time if, you, if, if you're a farmer and you feel like you can get access to capital credit. Interest rates are low, and I'm not adv advocating going into debt, but you know, that's, that's, that's possible now, maybe, maybe more than it was before. So I know, know, know a number of farmers that have taken advantage of really low interest rates to scale. So there's risk, it's a business, but at the end of the day, there's a lot of hope for folks. That's great. <laughs> want to uh, thank AGC for this amazing panel and for letting me go over. <laughs> Very indulgent of me. Uh, and I'm going to pass the mic back to Lauren. Hello, everybody. Uh, what a wonderful session. I really appreciate the, um, the resilience and the ingenuity that exists within this community. We started off this session talking about reframing the way we think of farmers. Um, we talked about the amazing capacity for innovation and resiliency that exists within these communities. Everyone here is doing something to drive a pandemic proof food system. It, it starts at a scale that cares about a community. Um, when Asher talked about the scale of these abattoirs and how they're able to care about these communities, what Yemi is doing, you know, fully integrating a community into that production, working with schools, working with local advocacy, working at peop with people that, that haven't had access to these products before. I mean, you know, this is amazing work. And it takes not just farmers to advocate and shape a pandemic-proof food system. It takes everyone. You know, Joe has brought forth the community. Hundreds and hundreds of people are working together on this robust local goat economy. These are the models that are needed. These are the models that we have to see in, in our future. We have to be careful of the kind of interventions and solutions that are being celebrated, ones that maybe further dehumanize our producers, ones that further centralize our production. And we have to ask these tough questions and we have to challenge them and together be aware that a food system and a healthy food system starts with the healthy people that exist in it and that's all of us. So I want to um, invite everybody Next week, we have an amazing session um, on spiritual farming, as well as alternative models of finance. We have an, a farmer from Thailand who's gonna be presenting. Uh, he's done incredible work revolutionizing grassroots advocacy to bring the community together to self-fund an over $5 million enterprise, right? It's an unbelievable, and that will be moderated by uh, Woody Tash of, of Slow Money. Um, on Monday, which is really important, we want to hear people's thoughts. We want to cultivate a community and be able to digest and dialogue around these issues. So please, on Monday at 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, link is in the emails. You can register at agrowingculture.org slash HFJ. Um, we want to invite the community for more intimate sessions um, where everybody has a chance to communicate and learn from each other and we can digest these issues. Um, Please feel free to support the broadcast. You can text GROW to 850-600-2996, or you can go to growingculture.org slash donate. We do our best to bring these sessions, to work with the technical difficulties. We have an amazing global community here today. You know, it's, it's, it's really important that people hear voices, not just from Brooklyn and North Carolina, but from Kenya as well. And thank you, Joe, so much for, for sharing with us. Um, please share the series, promote it. Um, every week is different format, different dynamic, um, different voices, and we're going to try to bring the voices that aren't centered on as much. 
Finally, thank you to our sponsors, Milgram and Dascom and Eat Your Way Clean. Without this, we cannot, without their support, we cannot keep these shows going. So thank you so much, everybody.